I'm wondering how many of you have experienced this fear of a blank sheet of paper, the intimidation. Well, my junior year at MIT, I had that at in a huge scale. I was taking a class called 270 Introduction to Design, and we were all given a box of parts, and we had to build a robot out of it. And I was just completely stricken with fear because I look into this box of parts and I said, how am I gonna turn this into a robot? And what's worse, I actually, I had to take the class to graduate and it wasn't just any class, it ended in a tournament, robot versus robot, okay? <laughs> and so and at MIT, this is bigger than football. <laughs> That, that basically was our football, nerd football. <laughs> and so the stakes were really high, and uh, I was seriously thinking about changing my major. <laughs> but then what I did was I went into the shop, and I started tinkering and playing. And this is actually me in the shop. <laughs> and as I spent some more time, I realized that how the parts might fit together, and I started playing, and I started realizing, like, oh, I could do this, I could do that. And as soon as I let go of the sort of the end goal, then I actually lost that fear. And as time went on, I started building it. Word got around that I was actually going to win. So a TV camera started uh, following me around. Um, in fact, I made it into the finals. <laughs> and that's me right after I lost the finals. Turns out that I was not a very good driver. <laughs> um, but I did learn a really important thing. By letting go of the outcome and allowing myself to explore, I was able to just kind of unleash my imagination and my ability to create. Now, the problem was I was in for a rude awakening because that's not the way things worked in the real world. My first job, I worked on the space shuttle main engine. And my first project was to build a part for the welding robot. And the problem was I was not allowed to work in the machine shop anymore because we each had our roles. The engineer designed the parts and the machinist made the parts. And that's the way it was and it was totally separate. So I had to figure out exactly what I wanted, draft it up. I think we had CAD back then, but I'm not sure. It was like basically, you know, send it off and then wait for weeks for it to come back. And so, and of course you're like hoping it's gonna come back the way you, you wanted it. Um, and so there's a separation between the creating, the imagining and the creating, and it was really stifling to my creativity, and it was just really frustrating. So imagine you're Michelangelo, but you can't touch the paintbrush. You have to tell someone else what you want and ha have them paint it for you. And what's worse, imagine that you have to send the note across the country by Pony Express and wait weeks for the message to come back to you about what happened, and that's what it felt like. And that's kind of sometimes what it feels like a lot of times when you're working in this environment, where you really, you know, you might be um, hiring a web developer and, you know, you, you have to wait until they do some work, um, or maybe you're partnering with a manufacturer in China and you're waiting for, to find out what they did. I believe we all have this basic intrinsic creativity and throughout my whole career, I've been really passionate about breaking down these barriers. But it wasn't until I thought back to that box of parts that I started thinking about how deep those barriers can sometimes be. And I think that there's two paradigms for creating. So there's the old model, where the, you're separating out the imagining from the creating, and then there's more of a new model, kind of like that, that class that I took, where they're really tightly intertwined. And I know that tinkering can have a really bad connotation and there's sometimes a um, kind of, a, there's, a, there's a fine line between uh, tinkering and wasting time. And I can't say how much I tinkered with this talk. <laughs> but um, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that kind of um, allowing yourself to explore, this, this um, freeing yourself during that creative process. And I see this really exciting future of serious tinkering, where we're going to have these tools that enable you to, to tinker with really and iterate on these really important and big problems. And these tools are going to be available for anyone to use. 
And I'm going to give you a few examples uh, today and then also explore maybe a little bit about what that means to all of us. So throughout the 90s, um, I uh, was involved in many tech startups. And there was a process back then in software that we called the waterfall method. We may now call the waterfall method. Some of you know about this. So you basically, you have your roles again. So I was a product manager at one point. Um, develop what the requirements are, pass it on to the development team, the developers work on building it, then the build, and then the developers pass it on to the QA team and they test it, and then they release the new version months and months later and probably months late too. And so if you do things right, you hope that you get back what you asked for. The question also is, did you ask for what somebody wanted? You could have invested all this effort into a product no matter how much market research you did, that nobody really wants. So imagine that. You invest all that in investment in that, all that time and effort, and then nobody really wants it. There's, a new, there's another approach, which even though many companies still do the waterfall method, but there's another approach that's called uh, agile uh, development. And instead of figuring it out all in one go and then just kind of throwing it over the wall and hoping for the best, uh, instead, you come up with a minimal viable product, MVP, and you test it, you take that, you evaluate, you iterate, and you test it, you evaluate, and you keep on building, building, building. And so creating becomes learning. And big tech companies like Amazon, they're masters at this. They will actually, unsuspecting to us, they will be testing, A-B testing, new ideas on a live site, and then um, always evaluating how immediately how it's impacting the sales on that site. And so they are constantly creating and they're constantly learning. Now a lot of folks talk about technology as a way of making things more efficient. But I love how good tools can make anyone be able to play a really integral part in this development process, and they don't have to be experts. So there's none of this like, you know, you're not a web developer or you're not allowed in the machine shop. Technology is available to anyone, and the creators can have permission to play. So let me give you a couple examples. Let's say I have a new company or a new initiative. I can go and use one of these really easy to use tools, web tools, put together a website, have a beautiful, simple, but beautiful website to start, and now I'm a real business. Or, for example, and back in the day, like, oh my god, HTML. Like, can you imagine creating just a basic website with HTML? It would take four months, where now it takes like four hours. Um, GarageBand. I, uh, when I first, used GarageBand, I started tinkering around, and I was like, oh my god, I'm making music. And I'm no virtuoso, and I'm not saying that it's, it was amazing, but I do have to say that the first, like one of the first pieces I made, I like so much that I now have it as the intro to my podcast, The Art of Manufacturing. <laughs> so, um, so it's pretty amazing what you can do. Um, I think that what we, um, we take these things for granted, right? So we're like, oh, of course, you know, yeah, of course I can create this kind of a website. Um, but I don't know if any of you realize like, the, what, the, what those examples have in common. All the examples up until now have been in the digital domain. But what I'm especially excited about is the potential to tinker in the physical domain. And I think that we're about to enter this pivotal moment in manufacturing because we are going to have these tools and these platforms that will enable us to now iterate on this grand and physical scale. So let me give you one example. This is a CNC machine, and CNC stands for Computer Numerical Controlled. And, uh, and what's really amazing about a CNC machine, and I mean, this isn't new. Like back when I was in college, they just started, they started having these. But CNC machine will enable you not only to make parts faster, but enables you to create parts that you've never been able to make before. You can't do this by hand, right? So, the challenge is that you're, the programming of a CNC machine is incredibly challenging. And if you're a designer, you need to understand the intricacies of working with one of these machines and what it's like to program. Now, there's a company that's out to change that. Their, their name is Plethora. They're an automated factory 
in San Francisco. And what they have is a software tool that you know, anybody can design something in CAD software. Um, but what it does is it tells you, it gives you feedback. It tells you, you know, what is hard to manufacture. It'll give you recommendations for making it easier to manufacture. And as you make the tweaks, it will change the price so you know how much you're going to be paying. And when you're ready, you press the button, and then the, there it is. The part is back. Um, you have it in three days. It's automatically made, which is amazing. And you don't even have to be an engineer. Um, and so this is an amazing way of just t delaying commitment. You don't have to commit. You can tinker before, in the software before you commit to metal. Now, speaking of commitment, I had this really funny thing happen to me a couple weeks ago. I was standing in front of Whiteboard. I was working with a branding agency. Um, and we were brainstorming. And it was, things were going great. And we had all these ideas. And we we're playing and you know, like this idea, that idea. And then all of a sudden, we're, we decided we're going to go over to this butcher box paper where we had these different categories. And my brain froze just like a few minutes ago. <laughs> and I, I said, said um, oh my god. I, I just can't think of anything. And I realized it was, the, it was the permanence of the Sharpie pen that got to me. And it was the weirdest feeling. And we were all laughing. And they ended up, they literally went over to this butcher box paper and started scribbling on it just to remove the preciousness of this piece of paper. And then once they started doing it, we started being able to come up with these ideas. And so it was just such a funny experience. And it made me think about what what would happen if not only if we could delay commitment, but what if we didn't have to commit at all? What would we be, what would we be capable of? And I think that there's a real opportunity there to explore that. So that reminds me of an entrepreneur. Her name is Jessie Janae. And she started her first company when she was 16 years old. She was making t-shirts. And then she started making inks and dyes for other entrepreneurs who were doing t-shirts and printing. And like any of the kind of up and coming um, and big, really big direct to consumer brands that are coming out, so like Warby Parker and Casper, MeUndies, all these companies, she started realizing the importance of packaging. Because packaging is the first experience that you have or a customer or consumer has with your product. And so, the only problem with packaging is that it takes a lot of resources to manage that process. And it's annoying because it's not really core to your product, right? So why are you spending all this time dealing with the supply chain and all that? And so what Jessie decided to do is she, um, her company, Lumi, now manages the supply chain and all the details of packaging for e-commerce brands. They have a dashboard. You can go, their customers can go on board, they can tweak uh, you know, with the fonts and everything, and they see what it's going to look like, and they um, can basically push a button the same way, uh, and then they get it delivered to them on demand. And the thing is, what's special is that Lumi will uh, handle, they, they negotiate cheap prices, bulk prices, and they handle all the logistics. And so changes are really easy, and they're cheap. So changing the logo is no big deal. Changing all the packaging is no big deal. So orders can be customized and delivered on demand. So what does this mean? Now here's an example. MeUndies, which is a direct-to-consumer brand of underwear. Um, this is their first package. They're a Lumi customer. But because it was so easy to make the changes, the marketing department started saying, well, well geez, why don't we do a special holiday edition? And why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? So now the marketing team, just like in social media and in website, the copy on the website, they can tweak the packaging as much as they want. And they never were able to do that before. And so it's a constant evolution of the product. And the packaging is now integral to their brand. And I think that we take this constant evolution for granted. But think back, it wasn't even 10 years ago, the very first ever TEDx. This is the first program. This is the program of the first ever TEDx. And the t our team had to, um, we produced it. And our team at USC and our, our team had to get all the copy together two weeks before the event print the program. And I'm thinking, like, ask any of the producers here to try to get us to give them the stuff two weeks in advance anymore. Forget it. 
Why would you do that? Nobody has a printed program. You put it in the app. You put it on the website. It's constant evolution. And so things are completely different now. Our ex expectations are totally different. OK, so one final example. Because you might be saying, well, geez, you know, that's fine. But these things are kind of simple. And there's not much bigger than a bread box. What if we were to look at something much bigger, like a car? Well, what does it take to make a car? Well, it costs a billion dollars to build a factory. It takes five years for an auto company to recoup the costs on that car. And think about how fast things are changing. Autonomous vehicles. How is Detroit going to start playing in the game of autonomous vehicles with a new car if they have to wait five years between editions of their car? Well, Kevin Zinger doesn't play by those rules. He's the founder and CEO of Divergent 3D. And they're a car company, a car factory, that uses advanced technologies like robotics and 3D printing. And I'm not talking about plastic, junky part, 3D printing, whatever. This is the first car. It's beautiful. Aluminum alloy chassis. Um, and so they can make all of the changes in software so they can iterate as much as they want. Um, so that's the learning by creating. The factory now costs 50, only $50 million compared to a billion. And it only takes them two years to bring an idea to market. And that's low commitment. And also, um, the first factory is in LA. Next one's going to be in Shanghai. They're going to be opening these micro factories around the world with each factory creating a, a car that's appropriate for that particular um, location. So that's like that constant evolution. So this is some serious tinkering we're talking about. So we talk a lot, you hear a lot about advanced manufacturing and what it means. And you know, people get really excited in the fourth, um, fourth industrial revolution. And people get excited about the technology. They're often worried about jobs. I like to ask a different question. Uh, I like to look at what does this mean for creativity and innovation. And things are changing incredibly fast. Um, we're talking about mass customization coming on a grand scale. Um, and we, we already see it. So plethora on the individual level. You have Lumi uh, working with emerging brands and Divergent 3D. They're, um, they're just starting from scratch so that they can tinker, right? But I think we all have to ask ourselves a question now. So what does it mean for us in the workplace? And as leaders, how do we apply these radical principles of tinkering to the sort of the legacy organization? And so I'd like us to think sort of in conclusion about how can we, as leaders, give our teams the permission to play um, regardless of their expertise? What, think about what tools do they need in order to succeed and in order to constantly learn by creating? And then also, what are the... Um, how can we have a decision-making process where it's like you're standing in front of a whiteboard instead of building a program? And also, how can we focus our creative energies into constantly evolving rather than reducing costs? Because I think every day we and our teams are looking into a box of random parts, right? We have these big goals. We never have enough time. We never have all the resources that we want. But if we apply these principles, to our existing organizations, I think we can fully unleash our creative potential and meet the opportunities and the grand challenges that we have ahead in the future. Thank you.